planet Earth. One of the greatest blessings we've been given. Our land provides the food we eat, the water we drink, the very air we breathe. Maybe more than any others, cooperative members know the importance of taking care of our Earth because many of us live off that land. But times have changed since cooperatives first started lighting up the countryside. Our population has grown, cities thrive, industry and technology flourished. And everything we do impacts our land. From the number of cars on the streets to the amount of trees we cut down, even how much electricity we use. Fortunately, our electric cooperative has a long history of effectively balancing good environmental practices and keeping electric rates low. Reliable and affordable electricity, that's the cooperative difference. Today, however, that cooperative way of life is being threatened. The government, activists, and lobbyists are trying to legislate how cooperatives provide power to our members. They think they know what's best for cooperatives. But the things they have in mind, well, let's just say they come at a cost, a very expensive cost to cooperative members. To understand the struggle co-ops are facing, you first need to understand the power mix we buy from Associated Electric. We always dispatch the lowest cost units first. So last year, for example, our coal units are still our lowest cost unit, and that's why 75% of our energy last year was from coal. About 15% was from natural gas. In addition to the coal and gas, which are fossil fuels, we have some wonderful renewables on our system as well. Last year we got 5% of our electricity from hydropower, and it's a great source for helping us keep our rates low. We also have wind projects. So the majority of power we use at White River comes from coal. We're not the only ones. Across America, 42 million people in 47 states get their power from co-ops. And 70% of that co-op power comes from coal. And there's a good reason for that. We have right now about 240 years of coal under the earth. Our country has relied on coal-fired generation for many, many years. Over the years, we've advanced the generation technology as well as the air emission technology to bring these plants along so that they're, they're very efficient. Missouri rates are some of the lowest in the United States because we have a clean coal fleet that's very efficient. So, coal is cheap and we have plenty of it here in America. So what's the problem? Well, here's where our story gets a little complicated. As much as we think coal is a good thing, there are those out there who disagree. And it all comes down to this, climate change, what some call global warming. The theory that the temperature of our planet is warming, changing our weather patterns, and even increasing the number of natural disasters. I'm gonna find out what this global warming is all about. Come on. We're just asking people if they can explain to us what global warming is. Global warming? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I don't believe in global warming. You just gave me like 10 seconds. I could turn around and Google it real quick. You know what global warming is? No. No? Mm -mm. Okay. How I really about... don't care. Sorry <laughs> to interrupt you. I know that's really important. But um, can you tell me what global warming is? I don't know, but I can do a cartwheel. <laughs> okay. Wow. That was a good cartwheel. You on Duck Dynasty? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, hey, I just want to ask but you. But I have been on TV before. You have? In the beard contest. Y did you win? Yes, I did. Well, great. Well, yep. then that's Remember really. Three years ago. That's really going to help out with this next question then. See that trolley over there just waiting around like he? Yeah. Well, why do you think that's caused it? Global, Global warming. warming. What's happening on the moon, probably. Got it all messed up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the, the moon is causing the global warming. Yeah, I think so. Stop shooting stuff up in the air that don't belong up there. Like fireworks and... No. Oh. Like rockets. Rockets? Yeah. Because it changes all the atmosphere up there. Well, then how are we going to get to the moon? It's something that Al Gore is behind. <laughs> it's a his fault. He it's invented a, the internet a, and caused global warming. They're shooting all that stuff up there. The right, they're shooting all, stuff up all there. All the rockets up there. We don't want all them rockets. No, those rockets are causing global warming. Do you know what greenhouse gases are? I have no clue. I know what a greenhouse is. You get concrete, people, gas from the car up down the road, and the chemical stuff they use, you're going to have green gas warming. Yeah. Have you guys ever heard of greenhouse gases? I've heard of it, but I just don't pay attention to it. What can you do about it? We can't do anything about it. No? Especially if you don't know what it is. Bottom line is that global warming is a little confusing, huh? Uh, yeah. Time for a little science lesson. Good morning, class. Today we're going to talk about climate change. And when we talk about climate change, 
we have to talk about the sun's radiation that comes into the planet, balancing that which comes off the Earth and back into space. Now there are some scientists who believe we alter that balance by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and greenhouse gases, they take radiation that comes off from the Earth and then re-radiates that back in all directions, some going out into space, some coming back toward the Earth. And when it comes back toward the Earth, we warm the planet. And there are some scientists who feel that human activities is causing this effect, and there are other scientists who disagree. No matter what side you believe, that climate change is human-induced or just a natural occurrence, the truth is this. The people that do believe that we can take action and stop the consequences of climate change will do everything in their power to do so, at all costs. And you can bet the government is going to get involved. So, who are the players in the environmental game? First, you have the President of the United States. Second, there's the Congress, both on the state and national level, who can introduce their own environmental bills. Third, there's the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, They've got 17,000 employees whose job it is to protect the earth, air, land, and water. Now, they may all mean well, but in an attempt to protect the environment at any expense, their pending regulations may actually hurt the people who live in that environment. And by hurt, I mean hurt their wallets. The dilemma we have as electric cooperatives today is 80% of our electricity comes from clean coal plants. Now, why is that? That's the case because in the 80s, electric cooperatives were growing rapidly. We needed new generation. Natural gas wasn't available because the federal government said you can't generate electricity with natural gas. Nuclear was not available at the time because there was a moratorium on nuclear energy. Our only choice as co-ops in Missouri was to build coal plants. And our federal government at that time encouraged us to go with American energy coal. Soon after Washington dictated the cooperative's huge investment in coal, along came hundreds of pages of new regulations and stricter standards dealing with fossil fuel generation. Some of these environmental laws and regulations made sense. Others were politically motivated. But all of them came at a big cost to the cooperative world. Big. We spent $1.1 billion since 1990 to convert our plants to use low sulfur coal and also to build pollution control or emissions control equipment to reduce nitrogen oxides. We've also had to add staff at the plant. We monitor every emission that comes into the plant and every emission that goes out of the plant every second of every day and that includes the air and the water. And if you look at those as a whole, the pollution control equipment and the staff that we've added, we spend $61 million a year to monitor and to comply with those regulations. I really think that electric utilities should be getting a medal from the federal administration. Instead, we're getting beat up and accused of not doing enough. But if you look at the actual numbers, since 2007, the electric utilities in, in the United States has reduced its carbon dioxide emissions by 8%. So even though the Environmental Protection Agency agrees that the air is cleaner today than it has been in decades, new regulations just keep on coming. On June 25, 2013, President Obama held a special press conference to announce his sweeping new climate change agenda. I'm directing the Environmental Protection Agency to put an end to the limitless dumping of carbon pollution from our power plants and complete new pollution standards for both new and existing power plants. Using executive power and completely bypassing Congress, the President launched a personal war on coal. The president has called for an all of the above energy strategy, but in fact it's really just an all but one energy strategy because the policies that have been proposed eliminate the ability to ever generate electricity with coal. The president's new climate change initiative will affect us because we're, we're kind of dependent here in the Midwest upon coal because that's where our assets are. It means that those plants that they've paid for over the years won't be used anymore there'll be stranded investment that you've made. And nobody's ever asked, well, who's gonna pay for all this? And people say, well, the government's gonna pay for this. The government is you, it's the people. It's the taxes that we all pay. 
And this is very problematic, particularly in areas who haven't recovered from the recession, where we still see high unemployment. We're talking about money out of your pocket for government to pay for new government regulations. Are you willing to pay 25%, 50%, 100% more than you currently do today to comply with government regulation? Bottom line. So the government is out to get coal. Why don't we just stop burning coal? Switch to renewable energy sources. Change is good, right? What utilities need is a balanced, diverse set of generating resources that can work together. And by removing coal, we're moving one, it's most affordable, and two, most consistent and reliable resource. So as you remove that out of your system and you make decisions to rely on other generation, you take on more risk and you take on more cost. Really, we're forced into an option of saying natural gas is our only option. And any time you tell somebody that's their only option, what happens to the price? The price goes up. Supply and demand says that. If we eliminate our alternative, we don't have any negotiating power with the gas suppliers. I guarantee your electric rates are going to go up. We can't always depend on renewables because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and the rivers don't always flow and that's where coal comes in. If you were going to retire, you wouldn't put your entire retirement future into any one company. You would diversify. And it's the same thing when we're planning a power supply for our kids and our grandchildren. We want to make sure that we've got a diverse supply of resources so that if we don't predict the future correctly, we have all these different resources to fall back on. And coal won't be the only thing affected by carbon regulations. Remember when we said that 15% of our electricity comes from natural gas? CO2 emissions don't just come from coal. Natural gas generation also produces carbon dioxide emissions. The Sierra Club has already said they're beyond a beyond coal campaign and they're focused on a beyond gas campaign. And their mission is to eliminate natural gas-based generation. So what are we going to do for an energy supply in this country? Are we going to tell everybody, you can cruise the internet when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing, but please don't do any dishwashing or clothes washing at night when that isn't happening. So where do cooperatives stand? More than anything, we believe there needs to be a balance. We've been proactively doing what's right for our planet for years, while keeping our rates affordable for our members. One third of the electric cooperative members in the state of Missouri are over 65 years of age. And 80% of that one third are on a fixed income. The other two thirds of our electric cooperative members in Missouri are also greatly impacted from any increases because wages in Missouri are lower than the national average. In fact, we're 11% below the average. So any increase is a tougher pill for us to swallow than other states. We believe Missourians should not have to pay more than other parts of the country for climate change legislation just because of how our electricity is produced. Every place is different and we have to honor regional differences, but we also have to understand that people can only afford so much. We have to be able to weigh and balance efficiency and conservation and the use of renewables with affordability. If you back up and you really look at it, it is a bullseye on about eight or nine states here in the Midwest where the energy bills are at such a reduced cost. A lot of states aren't really that impacted by a carbon standard or development of a carbon technology for coal plants because the reality is their state doesn't generate electricity with coal. But in our case, it's going to change the quality of life in rural Missouri. We know that. If this plan goes into place and raises electric rates to the point that we fear, it could change your life. It could force businesses to close. What's going to happen to our primary industry in this country? It's going to go overseas. When they see their rates going up 20%, 40%, they'll find better places to make steel and to make aluminum and to have jobs. We also believe that federal and state environmental policies need to be realistic. You can't just enact laws before the technology to comply with those laws actually exists. The technology to remove carbon from coal emission is at a very, very early stage. And it is not what we call a proven technology in our industry yet. Honestly, even the president realizes the technology isn't in place yet. We'll need scientists to design new fuels. And we'll need farmers to grow new fuels. We'll need engineers to devise new technologies. And we'll need businesses to make and sell those technologies. 
And you know the sad thing is, all these new regulations may not even make a difference. The problem that exists is when we start limiting carbon out into the air, we may be doing it here in the United States, but at the same time we're not burning coal, that coal is being sold somewhere else. It's been sold to China. China is increasing by 7% a year. They're emitting twice as much carbon dioxide as the United States today. By 2020, they'll be emitting almost four times as much carbon dioxide as the United States. They build a coal plant every week. The policies that have been proposed that we need to reduce United States carbon dioxide emissions by 17% by the year 2020. If you look at what that means on a global scale, given that China is increasing their emissions and will continue to do so, the difference that that policy will make is 0.7% on a global emissions basis. 0.7% is not going to save the planet. It's not going to make a difference to the planet. Nobody's going to be able to tell what changed with that small of a change, except our members who are paying the bill. So today, it's carbon dioxide. Tomorrow, who knows? The regulations just keep on coming. And these potential regulations can actually affect the co-op's ability to access the money needed to comply with new regulations. The National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation is a finance company that was formed by electric cooperatives in the 1960s for the purpose of aggregating their need for investment capital. Clearly, emerging environmental requirements are a major issue that we work with when we talk to the people on Wall Street that buy the bonds at CFC Shell, because in the final analysis, our electric cooperatives are successful if their members can pay their electric bill. And anything that increases costs and affects the affordability of energy ultimately has an impact on what we can do for electric cooperatives in the capital market. So just when co-ops may need loans to pay for new environmental regulations, it may be harder and more expensive to get that capital. Seriously, enough is enough. We're in a very capital intensive business. A power plant can cost two billion dollars and it might serve our members for 40 or 60 years. We're making decisions not just for this year or next year, we're making supply decisions for our kids and our grandkids literally today. And if we don't know what the rules are going to be, and they're going to be endlessly litigated, we can't make a decision like that with our members' money. What's happening across the industry right now is many companies are choosing to close their coal plants rather than invest more capital in them. They have to ask, what's the situation if I invest hundreds of million dollars in an existing plant, will that plant still be operating two or three years from now? If those plants are shut down, it has a huge impact on Missouri's economy. There'll be huge job losses, communities will be impacted, and we'll be heading into another recession in the state of Missouri. We're gonna have the continual reductions under the president's plan where we can't even meet it with natural gas. So we're gonna to have to do something that hasn't been done before, which is figure out how to run a grid on entirely intermittent resources. Now, some have said, well, you just reduce your household energy consumption. You're gonna to have to reduce your household energy consumption by something like 80%. To live on a, a reduction of 80%, you literally do have to live like we lived in the 1920s, when houses did not have air conditioning, when they didn't have electric heat, and when you might have one light bulb per room. That's the kind of lifestyle changes that are necessary to get to 80% reduction. It just doesn't seem right or fair when we've done what is financially prudent, paid for these assets, have them out there, and all of a sudden we change the rules. We're generating more electricity with far less emissions, and all we keep doing is bleeding our customer pockets dry with more regulations and more tax money. So, it all comes down to this. Decisions are being made right now in Washington, D.C. that will dramatically affect all of us in the Show Me State. Decisions that determine if new businesses choose to open in the Ozarks. Decisions that affect whether you can take a family vacation, whether we can save for retirement, and even whether we can put dinner on the table. If we were to take all the policy actions that are being recommended, we would raise energy prices across the country. We would drive jobs overseas because energy intensive industries will go where they're still burning coal, like China. And we will not actually save the planet. So what are you going to do? You're busy, you got carpool, and two jobs. And your to-do list around the house is a mile long. And you're just one person. Here's where you're wrong. When all the co-op members come together, 
Our voices are strong and loud. And you've got all the tools you need. A phone, a pen and paper, Twitter, Facebook, and most importantly, a voice. You have a voice. The bottom line is, is that White Rivers member owners own the co-op. And if they don't participate in the process, if they don't get involved in what the government may or may not try to do, guess what? Somebody else is going to. Now is the time to gather together, to be prepared, to be educated, and to be ready. When Washington, D.C. tries to legislate our future, we're going to make sure the co-op nation is there to be heard. When you come together, if you engage, and you make your voice heard, it will make a difference. I've seen it happen time and time again. And that really is the strength of the electric cooperatives. You've got 42 million people standing there with you. That's more people than any other association in the country. White River Valley Electric Cooperative is making it easier than ever before for our members to have a voice through joining the new White River Member Alliance Program, or MAP. This core group of members will volunteer to take a stand for our co-op when we need it most. We're asking you to help remind our elected officials just who they're supposed to be representing. We want to use the Congress to help us get our message across that you can't go very far on this without impacting not only the American economy, but the American people. As a MAP member, we're going to make sure you have all the information you need so that when the co-op nation is threatened, you'll be educated and confident to act. It may be something simple like signing your name on a petition, talking about the issues with your neighbors, or just knowing which candidates support cooperatives when you go to vote. We want you to take away from this MAP program an idea of what's actually causing your electric rates to go up and become more expensive, and the results of where regulation could take you at some point. Now we won't be calling on our MAP members with every new breeze that blows through Washington, but when there are serious issues that demand your attention, that's when White River will put out the call to get involved. We have to be the tip of the spear. The tip of the spear that will go out further than anything else in order to make people listen to what we're saying. As a MAP member, you can help chart the direction our co-op is going. It's free to join MAP, but your involvement is priceless to the cooperative world. MAP is your chance to be more involved with the co-op you own, to have a louder voice. We need you to step up and be a part of the cooperative and be an informed part of the co-op. It says to our politicians, enough's enough. Quit trying to take away the assets that we put so much money into and leave our electric rates alone. More than 70 years ago, Co-ops like White River Valley Electric Cooperative were formed by future thinking citizens who were willing to take a risk when no one else would to make sure rural folks got the electricity they too deserved. Today, we're taking a stand to ensure cooperative members keep the reliable electricity we fought for at a price all of us can afford. The co-op needs you now more than ever before. We need your voice to protect our wallets, to protect our way of life, and to protect our future.